I might be fired up. <laughs> Just a bit. Don't you love God's Word and the yeah. Spirit of God moving in our lives? Amen. Man, serving God is not boring. I'll tell you that. I hope you brought a Bible today because we're going to look at it. We're going to study it. Uh, we got a lot of scripture. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to do the message a little different. We're going to go and, and we're going to walk through a story this morning and kind of pull some highlights out of this story. So there's going to be a lot of scripture in this story. And, uh, and so you're going to want to have a Bible with you as we kick off this series. And if you don't have a Bible with you, then you can just download an app real quick. Uh, the Abundant Life Forwarding app is good. The uh, Uversion app is good. And you can also take notes there as well. So we're going to kick off this series. It is called Chain Reaction. Chain Reaction. So we're going to be looking at the process of chain reactions in our life. And Pastor Matt talked a, a bit about this already, that we are going to be looking at the impact that things, decisions, relationships, all those things have on us. Do you know that, uh, have, you, have you figured out that the things that, that you decide and do in your life, they ripple way beyond what you even see? Have you discovered this before? you have anyone who has impacted your life in a positive way that they probably don't even know that they did? Yeah. Right? So there's a chain reaction that happens. Now, scientifically speaking, a chain reaction is a little bit different. A chain reaction would be a chemical reaction. Anybody good at chemistry? Two people, three people, maybe you're good at chemistry. Okay, good. Uh, Mr. Squires, don't you teach science? A little bit? So he's good at chemistry, take his class, although I don't know. You have to be good at it. Uh, well, so it's a chemical reaction, really. And so, uh, for example, so has anyone ever been to Georgia and seen like the red dirt? The red dirt in Georgia, the red clay? Isn't that, do you know that dirt isn't naturally red, right? We know this, right? The dirt here is a, a nice, gritty, rocky, like, worthless brown color, right, you know, here. But the, the dirt in Georgia, a lot of it is red, and why is that? Have you ever wondered why the dirt is red in Georgia? Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, there's a combination of a lot of things. Have you ever stepped out of the airport in Georgia and went, <gasps> and found the humidity to hit you in the face? All right, so that's one factor. The humidity in Georgia does something about it. The soil composition is, is different. Uh, the chemical makeup is a little bit different. The rainfall that comes and the way that it comes. And, uh, and what happens is all of these factors in the environment drain the soil of, his, of its nutrients. And so what happens is the naturally occurring... If you want a real lesson on this, then you can see Anita afterwards. She can teach you about soil. Uh, but but the, the deal is, is it drains all the nutrients out of the soil. And so the soil becomes very rich in iron oxides. And the thing that turns the soil red is actually the iron oxides, which makes it turn into a red clay. And so you have this Georgia red clay uh, that is known for this region. And it's, it's not like someone just showed up with a bottle of red food coloring and colored all the dirt. Right? There's, a, there's a natural process. And it's not just one thing. It's a series of things. It's a, a bunch of factors that, when combined together, create an environment in which the soil ends up turning this reddish color because of this iron. And so it isn't just one simple thing. It, all these things have to play into it for it to happen. If you remove some of these things, then the soil uh, gets back its, its base form that it's supposed to have, and it won't stay that color. So does that, does that make a little bit of sense? So it's a chain reaction. It's a chemical reaction between all these different factors that go together. And kind of like life, where we have all these different factors that lead into the things that we do and that we see and that end up happening. Now, in, in life, practical life application, the word chain reaction has a slightly different meaning. It's not so much of a chemical reaction, but it's more of a series of events. And, and the definition of a chain reaction in life would be a series of events that are so related to each other that each one initiates the next, or a number of events triggered by the same initial event. Right? So, so, for example, uh, you signed up to volunteer at Summerfest Outreach, and you met one person who didn't know Jesus, and you told them about Jesus, you told them about the church, and they come to this church, you lead them to the Lord, and they move to, I'm making this up at this point, they move to South America and start a, a, a revival in a continent. Right? That would be a chain reaction, a series of events that happens from one event. Don't underestimate the, the power of a hello. 
because they can cause a chain reaction in our life. And that's what we're going to be studying in the sermon series, the impact of one decision, one relationship, and one encounter. These choices that we make, they set off a series of chain reactions, and we've all experienced them. Sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes you wish you could just take that chain reaction right on back. And we're going to look at both because I think it's important for us to not, not just see that the, the positive impact of decisions that we make in our life, but we also have to understand that the decisions that we make, if they're not the best decisions, there are repercussions that happen down the line as well with this process. So we're going to look at all these. So this morning, we're going to start with the story of a literal chain reaction. It's about a man in chains. It's about a man in chains whose encounter with Jesus set off a re fire of revival in a region. And our story, we're going to start in Mark chapter 4. So if you would turn to Mark chapter 4, we're going to kind of look at the beginning of this story. The, the thing is with this man and his story is the story begins before it looks like it begins, and the story ends beyond what it, where it looks like it ends. And we're going to look at the whole thing this morning, starting with Mark chapter 4. Did you find it yet? Mark chapter 4? All right, you found it right up there. Okay, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. We'll start right there. It says that that day when the evening came, he, being Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Just Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you love that Jesus was sleeping in the midst of the chaos? Don't, I can sleep in the midst of chaos, and my wife doesn't, like, she's hired when you sleep in the midst of this chaos. I should just tell her, oh, I'm just being like Jesus, <laughs> and then it'll work. <laughs> Maybe I can get away with it. It says that he got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. So here what we have happening in, in this story is as they are trying to move from one side to the other side, okay? So they're just crossing over the sea. That's, that's all they're doing. But there is a wind that's coming against them that is stopping them from getting to the destination that Jesus was trying to get to. Now, here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't say in this story, let us do our best and let us try really hard to get to the other side and hope we make it. Jesus knew where he was going to land. It wasn't a, it wasn't a question mark for him. And so he had peace in the midst of this because he knew he was going to get there. I want to show you a map so we can kind of understand the context of this whole, this whole story of this man. So we are up here at the Sea of Galilee, up at the top. So we are here in this, in this region, and you may have heard of Bethlehem and Jerusalem. We've heard of those places, right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the region of Judea. And then in between Judea and Galilee, where Jesus grew up in Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, you have the region of Samaria. And this was all a Jewish region over here to our left. Now, when you cross over to the region on the right called the Decapolis, it was a region of 10 cities, 10 regions, and it was a Greek area. So it was, it was a Gentile region. Okay, so the Jews kind of were on one side and then the, the Gentiles were on the other. So Jesus was actually crossing over into non-Jewish territory at this point as a Jewish rabbi. And so they were on the Sea of Galilee and they were moving from, from the west into the east. Now, normally on the Sea of Galilee, the wind blows from the west to the east, which was, is convenient if you're going west to east because the wind will help get you there. But it appears in this story that the wind was actually blowing from east to west, which, which happened very rarely. It was an abnormal weather pattern that was keeping them from the other side. Okay, so there's something going on that's just not right. When you, when you see something and you're, you're going, what is happening in this story that doesn't, something doesn't add up? And, and when you begin to study out this, the, the weather and the, the historical things, something's off on this story because that's not how the wind and the waves are supposed to behave on the Sea of Galilee. So something was at play here. And, and so as I'm studying this through and you're trying to figure out what is going on here that is different, Jesus wakes up from his nap and it says that he rebuked the wind. He rebuked it. Now, 
Rebuke is an interesting way to respond to wind. It is an interesting way to respond to wind. It's a forceful, authoritative command kind of word. In fact, it's a fired up kind of word. Why was Jesus so fired up at the wind? Couldn't he have calmly have just woken up and said, in the name of me, be still? Right? Why couldn't he have said that? He didn't say that. It says that he woke up and he rebuked him. Jesus gets up from his nap and he is amped up. Why is Jesus so on edge here? Was it because he got woken up from his nap early? Because that does it for me. If you wake me up from my nap early, I might be a little ed edgy and someone's getting rebuked. Like that's what's going to happen in that moment. Can anyone relate to that in your life? All right. I, kids, I just said give me 15 minutes. Okay. So, so Jesus is fired up. Why is he rebuking the wind? He rebukes it. Now, this word rebuked, when you look in scripture, is usually associated with something else. It's usually associated when confronting demonic activity. That's when you see the word rebuked throughout Scripture over and over again. And when Jesus would take authority over, over demons, he would rebuke them. And so in our story, there's this inference that somehow, someway, there was a demonic influence in the wind. I don't know how that works, but somehow there was, it was there, and it was trying to prevent Jesus from getting to the other side, but that wasn't going to stop him. There was a demonic influence trying to keep Jesus from the other side of the shore. And Jesus wasn't about to let that stop him from getting there because he knew that there was a miracle waiting for him on that shore. He knew there was something on the other side that was about to be unlocked, that he was about to set off a chain reaction in a region. And when you know that God is about to do something big, I want to encourage you this morning, do not let obstacles get in your way. Do not let obstacles discourage you because a chain reaction may require some resilience to get started. Have you ever found that getting something started might take some resilience? Have you ever tried to start a campfire with a stick and a string, right? Your hands are blistered before it works and it takes a lot of effort. Personally, I give up way soon. I'm like, where's the matches at? This is not worth it. Do you have any Boy Scouts who have successfully done this, or Girl Scouts? Anyone successfully started a fire with a rock or a stick? Right here? All right. It takes some resilience, doesn't it? You got to keep working, right, Silas? You got to keep working at it, and, and eventually you'll get it. And that sets off a chain reaction. That begins the blaze going. Resilience has started, and in the same way, if you want to see a chain reaction happen in your life, and you're trying to turn something in your life, there is resilience. There is an endurance that is required. And Jesus wasn't about to let this wind get in his way. So he says, he rebukes the wind and says, be still. And of course, the disciples, it says terrified. The real word as we look in the Greek is that they were in awe and amazed. They, they weren't actually scared. They were just like, what is going on here? And you, be honest, you would do the same thing. You would do the same thing. And now, if you didn't know who Jesus was and all of him at that point, your, your guy wakes up from a nap and tells the wind to stop it, and it does, you would be kind of in awe as well. And so this is the beginning of this story. Now, we're going to go now to, to chapter 5 of Mark, and we're going to look at the next part and where this chain reaction really begins. We're going to meet a man in chains. It says in Mark chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Then they went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes, and Jesus got out of the boat. A man with an impure spirit, or the word here is evil or demonic spirit, came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day... Among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. We don't know exactly when Jesus said it. We don't know if Jesus said it on the boat on his way there. And the demonic activity in this man knew it, or if he said it when he arrived, but Jesus had said something. Then Jesus asked him, what's your name? What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. 
So here we have, let's take a look at what's happening here. We have this man in chains. Can you imagine the fear among the people in that region? It, do you, have, you ever, have you ever lived in, a, in an area where you, you see on the news that like an escaped convict is in your neighborhood or in the region of that area? Like it, you kind of, it freaks you out a little bit, right? If that were happens. Well, can you imagine the fear in the people? Like they had this guy who was out of his mind, he was violent, and they'd chain him up, and they'd put him out in the, where the, the graveyards were, stay out of town, and they'd bind him up in chains so that he couldn't do damage to any people. And then the crazy thing happened. His skin turned green, his clothes started bursting, and the chains broke. Like, it was kind of that kind of activity. Like, maybe he didn't get that big, right? Where was the Hulkbuster suit when they needed it? But this guy, like, can you imagine that what that fear would be like in you that you can't even subdue this guy? Like he somehow, he, he actually had supernatural strength that was being brought to him through demonic activity and he was breaking these chains off of him. They couldn't keep him subdued and he was kind of a terror to these people. They were all in fear of him. And so as Jesus approached, what happens is, is if you read, anyone read this story before? at all, or you, maybe you've read it, maybe anyone remember reading this story before? Okay, so Jesus approached, and what does it look like happened? So let's, let's just make a, a quick assumption here. He comes before Jesus, and he calls Jesus son of the most high God. In, in God's name, don't torture me. What does it look like he's doing? Anyone? Begging for mercy, what else? Surrendering, su- submitting. Did you know that that's not what's happening at all here? That's what it looks like, but that's not what's happening at all, because he was doing something completely different. He says, what do you want with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? Now, in these times, declaring someone's full name was an intimidation tactic. You would declare someone's full name to say, I know who you are, and it was a way to intimidate someone. Now, I'll give you an example. When your mama uses your full name, she means business, right? It was a way of saying, I know who you are, and you don't scare me. That, that was when you use someone's full name, and, they, and these demons cried out, Jesus, son of the most high God, I know who you are, and in God's name, don't torture me. See, they knew who he was, but they also knew that they weren't going to be able to hold power over him, so they, they put up this facade of intimidation, Now, to reinforce this idea of intimidation, the next thing that this man says, and it's not the man speaking, it's the demon in this man speaking, Jesus says, what's your name? I love Jesus doesn't play into this game. I'm sure Jesus knew the name. I'm sure Jesus isn't even going to give him credit. It it was like, I'm sorry, have we met before? I don't think I know you. you, Are you any significance? What's your name? And, and this, the demon who is, who is speaking for all these demons says, my name is Legion. You know what Legion means? It means a very large number. In fact, Roman armies had legions, and in each legion of a Roman army, it was three to 6,000 men. So here, the demons now are flexing on Jesus. Like, there's a lot of us. So we're going to intimidate you. We know who you are. Here's your full name. They got called out like they, were, like they were his mama calling out his full name, middle name and everything. And then they said, oh, and by the way, there's thousands of us. It was just a facade. But they decided we are going to intimidate. And here's what you got to know is that the enemy uses intimidation to stop a work before it gets started. You know this in your life when you feel like God's speaking to me and I got I to gotta step out in this thing and, and all of a sudden what happens in so many situations, we get intimidated. We get scared. Oh no, but this might happen and this might happen and we start overthinking it. You ever overthought something that God asked you to do? Yeah. You ever overthink yourself right on out of doing that thing that God asked you to do? Yeah, me too. All right. What happens though is the enemy will begin to intimidate you. Now it's one thing to overthink it, but when you, when you feel like God's saying something to you, and the next thing you, you hear is, well, if you do that, then, then this is going to happen, or this bad thing's going to happen. You, well, if you do that, then, then you know, this, this is probably going to happen, and, and it, this begins to work within you. The enemy will try to intimidate God's people before they begin the work of the chain reaction that God has in their life. 
But how many of you know that Jesus is the name above all names? They say, my name is Legion. Well, guess what? His name is bigger. His name is bigger. And the same Jesus who declared, I have been given all authority on heaven and on earth, refused to be intimidated in this moment. He would not be intimidated. And if you are going to see a chain reaction in your life, you cannot be intimidated by the empty threats of the enemy. And I want to tell you something, church, that's what they are, empty threats. Empty threats. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Do not be intimidated. When God begins to stir up a work in your life, do not allow intimidation to stop that work before it gets started. Jesus was going to let nothing get in his way, and he refused to be intimidated. Let's go on with our story in verse 11. Let's see what happens next. It says, A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank, into, steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had, been seen, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Okay, so this region, like I said, was a Gentile region. And Jesus had spent so much of his ministry, he had been ministering to the Jews. And you remember a guy named John the Baptist, right? He prepared the Jewish people to receive Jesus. And Jesus had been ministering to the Jews, but now as he crosses over into this non-Jewish territory... Hence the large herd of pigs. You weren't going to find a massive herd of pigs in Jewish territory. They didn't, they didn't do pigs, all right? And so there's all these pigs, and for some reason, Jesus says to these demons, because they, they, they want to possess something, go ahead and go into the pigs. The, the pigs run off a cliff, and they drown, and they die. Now, I will agree from a business perspective that is highly inconvenient, as a business owner of a couple thousand pigs. I, I, I don't think that I would be happy about it, but, but here's, the, here's the thing that I find odd about this story. Don't you think that not having a crazed lunatic in your town who breaks chains and creeps people out is a bigger deal than a couple thousand pigs? Like, that seems like a big deal. Like, that seems like they, they, would, they would have uh, some type of reaction to this man in the book of Luke says that they, he didn't even stay dressed. He, the guy just wandered around naked. He just ripped his clothes off. He was out of his mind, and, and he just creeped everybody out. And now you have this man. He's sitting there. He's dressed. He's having a normal conversation. And rather than being upset about some pigs dying, you think that humanity would look at this man who's obviously something has changed in him and say, we got to know what's happened to this guy. Are you kidding me right now? Something big has happened. But that wasn't the reaction of these people. Their initial reaction was to say, excuse me, sir, uh, what was your name? Jesus, we're going to need to ask you to leave. Uh, we're sorry, but, you know, we know you just got here, but, but this isn't going to work out. And their hearts were frustrated and their hearts were cold. They didn't receive Jesus at all. I want you to know this morning that initial responses don't define future outcomes. There's more to this story. We're going to get there. But there's times in our lives when we do something good and we don't get a good reaction. Has that happened to you before? Where you just didn't get the reaction that you were hoping for? You tell someone about Jesus and you, you spend some time and you invest in them and you, you've told them about Jesus and, and you've built a relationship and then finally they tell you, no, I'm just not interested. And you just think, God, I know you told me to, to invest in this person and tell them about you, and they just they don't seem interested. And God, I, I, I don't get it. I thought I was going to do some good. I thought I was going to help someone. I thought I was sent here for this. And, and you get into this place, and the response that you get back is just like it doesn't add up. I didn't think that was going to work out. Imagine how the disciples felt in this moment. Are you kidding me right now? We were just in a storm and thought we were going to die. And then we saw Jesus calm the storm and we came over. And this guy who obviously is, in, is insane is healed. And now they want us to leave. Are you kidding me? What kind of a response is that? 
And we've had these things happen in our own lives. And you got to know that Jesus didn't get a good reaction either. But that doesn't mean that the story was over. And in your life, when you know that you are an assignment from God and he has asked you to begin to, to walk in a certain direction, maybe you're working on a relationship in your life and you're doing exactly what God's asking you to do in this situation and you're not getting the response that you're hoping for. That initial response, that's not the end of the story. And that doesn't define the future outcomes. You know what defines future outcomes? The God of the universe. God defines future outcomes, and he has your best in mind. And so just because we don't get a good initial response doesn't mean that the story is over, because this man's story was far from over, and this chain reaction that Jesus came to set off was far from over. If the story ended here, it would be a disappointing story. I mean, it's great that Jesus went and, and healed a guy and set him free from a few thousand demons. That's a good thing. But then to get rejected right after that, there's got to be more. In Mark chapter 5, let's go to verse 18. It says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, so they asked Jesus to leave, and he says, okay, here we go. The man who had been, past tense, demon-possessed, begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Does Jesus ever do something different than you thought he would in your life? Anyone else besides me? Like, I'm sure this is what Jesus will do in this situation. I'm sure, Jesus, you just rescued me. Let me come with you and be with you. Oh, yeah, come, come with me. Jesus does something totally different. And, and two things stand out to me in this exchange that don't make any sense to me whatsoever just from an initial look. Because Jesus began his ministry to the Jews with these words, follow me. When I think of Jesus, I think of follow me. But Jesus is about to begin a ministry to the Gentiles with these words, don't follow me. It doesn't make sense, Jesus. Don't you know that's not the formula? But then the second thing he says it's also really odd because Jesus did so many miracles and, and it, I feel like every time he did a miracle, he'd say, don't tell anybody. Just don't tell anyone. Like, no matter what, I know I healed you. Don't tell anyone. I mean, they didn't listen to him. They just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't either. You, but don't tell anyone. And he says to this guy, go tell everyone. Jesus is doing things like he's not doing it the right way. That's not the response I would expect. I would expect that when Jesus sets this man free and no one else in the whole area of Decapolis wants anything to do with Jesus, he'd say, yeah, go ahead, come on with me, be close to me, you'll be safe with me, follow me, and, uh, and don't tell anyone. But he says, don't follow me and tell everyone. Why not just let this guy come with him? When I read this, I wonder that. Why not? If you'd been cast out of society and been demonized for years upon end, you'd want to leave with Jesus too. You've got a bad reputation at this point. No one wants you. The people in Decapolis, they don't want this guy who set you free. They don't want anything to do with him. But here's the thing you got to know about Jesus. He always has a bigger picture in sight. Always. There's always a bigger picture that Jesus has that you may not see. Because Jesus was setting up a chain reaction. He says, go home and tell how much the Lord has done. And then we get to the end of the story. And then the story goes on about Jesus raising a dead girl and healing a sick woman, and it looks like, well, that's the end. And you know what? When we look in the Bible, there's no mention of this man ever again. This man who Jesus set free from these chains, who lived among the tombs, that's the last mention of him. And if we're just reading through the Bible and going, oh, well, that was weird. Because that kind of just seems like a weird way to end a story, doesn't it? Okay, well, that's odd. Jesus usually is more intentional than that. Jesus usually has like an end result in mind, but in this story, he just tells the guy, you know, go home and that's it. What happens? What happens with this guy? What happens? I want to know what happened. He went home. He says, go home. It says that the man went home and he did tell everyone what Jesus had done for him and people were amazed. I want to know what happened. What was their response? Did they receive him back? It says he began to tell in the Decapolis, the whole region, and they were amazed. 
Whatever became of this Decapolis? Did this Gentile nation, did they ever find God? To find out, we have to skip over to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to find the answer to this in Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 31 and verse 32. Sometime later, it says Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre, and he went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. Sound familiar? Jesus went back to the Decapolis. He went back to this place. There, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. Now, how would they know Jesus could do that? Well, how in the world? Why would, now, this is a different reception. What happened to leave? Now, Jesus comes back to the same region, and people are coming to him and saying, hey, will you please heal this? Will you please heal him? And Jesus heals this man, and people began bringing sick people to Jesus. There's a difference in the reception from the last time that Jesus came. Last time he was pushed away, this time he was embraced with open arms. People are bringing sick, to, sick people to him, and in chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, verse 1, we'll just read the first half of this verse. During these days, another large crowd gathered. Another large crowd gathered. So that means there was a crowd before this that was large that gathered, and this is the feeding of the 4,000 I want to get into this story next year. We're, going to, we're, we're probably going to look at some more stories in Mark. So there's, a, there's so much in here, but that's not the point of the message today. I really want us to talk about it, but we'll wait. So there's another large crowd gathered. Do you notice the difference in reception between this arrival at the Decapolis? What changed? What was the difference? How does a region that is so close to Jesus become open to him? How would they have known what Jesus can do? And I'll tell you, there's only one explanation. A chained man started a chain reaction. This man went away and began to tell how much Jesus had done for him, it says. And when Jesus returned, they were ready to experience him for themselves. This guy was like John the Baptist to the Gentile region. He was the one who prepared the way for the Lord in this place. We don't see his name and that's okay, because if your job is to prepare the way for the Lord, your job's not to get famous or to get recognition. It's to make Jesus famous. And this guy made Jesus famous in a non-Jewish region. And when Jesus returned, it was a completely different reception. When we take our Jesus encounter with us, we create an opportunity for others to encounter him. That's the kind of chain reaction that we can set off in our lives. Last, last week, week and a half ago, we were at Accelerate Camp with some amazing teenagers, and they had the same challenge, to go and take your story with you. Their, their call was to own their moment and to take that Jesus encounter with them out into their world so that others can encounter Jesus. And the same challenge is for us today. See, if this man would have just moved on with his life, it would have been a different outcome. If he would have just, oh man, this is great, I'm free, and moved on, who knows what the outcome would have been, but that's not what he did. His broken chains set other people free. Could you imagine what would happen if your life, if you allowed your broken chains to set other people free? Because that can happen. And some of you have experienced chains broken off of your life. I know many of you have experienced the freedom of Jesus, and I want to encourage you and tell you this morning that the freedom that you found in Jesus can actually set other people free. His freedom led to them finding theirs. You see, Jesus set off a chain reaction in his life, and I believe that Jesus wants to set off a chain reaction in your life too. That it goes beyond coming and gathering and growing together with God, which is so important for us but he wants to set a chain reaction off in your life. He wants to use your healing, and I believe that there was healing here this morning. I believe that God began a work of a miracle today, this morning in this place, and he wants to use that healing to bring hope and healing to others. I believe that God wants to use your story to rewrite someone else's story. Some of you have a story to tell that you're not telling, and God wants to, you to use your story so that someone else can find hope that God might rewrite their story. He wants to use your redemption to bring redemption to someone else. A chain reaction. A chain reaction. My challenge to you this morning is simple. Go and make a chain reaction from the work of Jesus in your life. Don't just keep it in here. 
Don't just keep it to yourself. See yourself as a part of a greater chain reaction that Jesus would do in your life. What would happen if you're in your life if rather than just saying, I'm so grateful for Jesus and what he's done in my life, which is important and good to remember. What if you saw your life as this? I get to be part of a chain reaction that God is going to use that goes way beyond me. And when you let God get way beyond you, amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. Will you stand with me this morning? I want to pray for you as we close. And Andrew's just going to lead us in a chorus. And, and as he does that, our, our ministry teams will be up front. And I want to invite you this morning. You might want prayer for something this morning that has absolutely nothing to do with this message. That's okay. We want to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're in a place this morning where you're dealing with intimidation from the enemy. You're feeling like you don't have the resilience to start something in your life. God wants to set off a chain reaction in your life. And maybe the prayer this morning is, I just don't, I just don't see it. I don't see how God could use me in any part of this process. And God wants to open your eyes this morning and show you how valuable, valuable you are to the chain reaction he wants to do through your life. So if you'd like prayer this morning for anything as we close in this song, I would ask you to come forward and let us pray with you. Lord God, this morning we come before you this morning. Set off a chain reaction in our life. We thank you for being such a personal God, for loving us, for rescuing us. Lord, I pray that that rescue would go beyond us, that you would use our lives to be a chain reaction for your glory. I pray, Lord God, for this Saturday, for Summerfest, that there would be a whole lot of chain reactions that start right there in that park on Saturday. I pray for chain reactions in our neighborhoods. I pray for chain reactions right now in our extended families. Lord God, I pray for chain reactions in workplaces. I pray for chain reactions in the midst of conflict and difficult situ situations. God, would you begin something today that goes beyond us? And would you give us the vision to see what you want to do that's beyond us? We say this morning, here I am, Lord. Use me. I want to be part of your process and your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name. Oh, 